Hello, welcome back, and welcome to Chapter 8 on Tectonics, Earthquakes, and Volcanism. Here's the stuff we're going to ignore. Here's the big questions we're going to answer in this chapter. What are Earth's history, interior structure, and materials? How does plate tectonics explain changes in Earth's surface? How do plate motions affect Earth's surface? So up until now, just about everything that we've looked at, temperature patterns, average temperature, temperature range, rainfall patterns, hours of sunlight, seasonal changes, all those things we've been able to explain just looking at latitude. And now we're going to get into the other the other most important factor in physical geography, and that is plate tectonics. And plate tectonics is going to answer pretty much everything that latitude can't. So why are there mountains in some places? That's plate tectonics. Why are there depressions or valleys? That's plate tectonics. And let's get into it. So the first and most important thing to talk about is endogenic versus exogenic processes. So when we're talking about plate tectonics with earthquakes and volcanoes and whole continents moving around, those are all powered, those are all termed endogenic. Processes driven by Earth's internal heat are endogenic. So the stuff that's powered from inside Earth is endogenic. Earthquakes, volcanoes, those are all endogenic processes. Processes driven by external factors, so outside the surface, gravity, wind, rain, those are exogenic. So rivers, glaciers, action at the beach, all of those are exogenic processes. If it's powered from the inside, that's an endogenic process. And if it's powered from external forces, that's exogenic. The external forces are exogenic. If it's powered from inside, it's endogenic. So let's talk about time. Earth is old. Earth is roughly 4.6 billion years old. The moon is about 30 million years younger. It was formed when something about Mars, Mars-shaped, Mars size, hit Earth uh, when Earth was very, very young, melted Earth partially, and a droplet of molten Earth bleep, came off the other side and cooled and became the moon. So I'm going to rattle off a whole bunch of numbers. BY is the abbreviation we use for billions of years. A billion is a thousand million. So BY is billions of years and MY is millions of years. Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. Our oldest rock or evidence of the oldest rock is about 4.25 billion years old. Life shows up about 3.4 billion years ago. Pangaea, which is the name for the supercontinent when all the last time that all the continents were together, that assemblage was called Pangaea. Pangaea broke up about 200 and started breaking up about 225 million years ago. The Cretaceous-Paleogene boundary, which marks the end of the dinosaurs, that happened about 66 million years ago, relatively recently. The Cretaceous-Paleogene, which is abbreviated KPG, uh, the KPG boundary about 66.4 million years ago. The Pleistocene is the last ice age. The last ice age started up about 2.5 million years ago. The Holocene is the term for the most recent period. It's also been proposed that the Holocene be renamed Anthropocene in, in recognition of the efforts humans have made, uh, the efforts, in recognition of the changes that humans have made to the planet. So we started doing agriculture about 10,000 years ago. The climatologist Rudderman thinks that anthropogenic or human-caused climate change also then dates to about 10,000 years ago when we domesticated rice and created giant artificial swamps, rice paddies, which released methane into the atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas. So we've got all these numbers, and one of the problems with geologic time is that it is deep. Earth is relatively old, but humans don't do well with big numbers. Carl Sagan, one of my favorite scientists ever, realized this and said, you know, 
if you told most people that something happened 66 million years ago and asked them, is that a long time ago or not a long time ago, just about everybody would say, that's a long time ago, 66.4 million years ago. But in terms of the age of Earth, it's really not. It's pretty recent. So Carl Sagan said, if you took all of Earth's history, we took all 4.56 billion years, 4 billion 560 560 million years of Earth's history, and you compress that into one Earth year. So you took 4.6 billion years divided by 365. So each day on the cosmic year then would have taken 12.49 million years on Earth. So using this idea of of compressing 4.6 billion years into one calendar year so that we can see when things happened relative to other things, we get a very different look. So Earth formed January 1st at the beginning of the cosmic year. Right now it's December 31st, 1159.99999 seconds. So it is New Year's Eve. It's December 31st right now in the cosmic year. So let's think, let's take a look and see when things happened relative to other things. The oldest rock shows up about six weeks into the year on Valentine's Day. Life shows up three months into the year on March 1st. Pangaea splits up December 12th. So if I told you Pangaea split up 225 million years ago, which is a number that you're going to need to know, that sounds like a really long time ago. If I told you it's December 31st and Pangaea split up December 12th, you'd probably say, well, that's just a couple weeks ago. That's relatively recent. Exactly. Pangaea split up relatively recently. The dinosaurs get whacked the evening of December 25th, so six days ago. Just under a week on the cosmic year is when the dinosaurs got whacked. Uh, The Pleistocene began December 31st at 7.15 p.m. Humans show up December 31st, 11.59 and 55 seconds, so five seconds before the end of the year is when humans show up. All of human history, all of recorded history is more recent than even that. All of recorded history is in the last half second of the cosmic year, the roughly 4,000 years of recorded human history. So uh, the cosmic year is important because it puts things into their perspective, relatively speaking. So things that happened millions of years ago using the cosmic year, oh, that's just December 31st or December 25th. That's just a little time ago. Here is a chunk of the rock that contains the zircon crystals that are 4.4 billion years, maybe. So these, these I think, are the zircon crystals. Those would be the oldest rock remnants on the planet from Australia. Uh, the geologic time scale. So we've got all that geologic time, and it's usually shown on the geologic time scale. Uh, there's two important things that I want you to know about the geologic time scale, and they're both right here. Number one, the major divisions, the major divisions mark key events in the fossil record. So the breaks in the geologic time scale, and I'll show you the geologic time scale in just a minute. You'll see that the breaks are based on identifiable, identifiable records in the fossil record. So that's thing number one that's important to know. Number two, the farther back we go, the less we know, because rocks are constantly being created and altered and destroyed and created and altered and destroyed. It's very hard to find really old rocks because they're constantly, especially rocks at the surface, rocks at the surface are getting broken down and made into soil, getting washed into the ocean. So it's hard to find old rocks that are undisturbed. Because they're rare, our understanding of the early earth is limited then by the evidence. The evidence would be old rocks and rocks are constantly getting worn down and modified. So it's very hard to find old rocks and therefore the farther back in time we go, the less we know. This is the diagram out of the book showing different uh, different periods in Earth's history, the five mass extinction events. We are in the middle of a sixth mass extinction event. So this is the this is like the, the super, super, super simple geologic time scale. Let's take a look at another one. So we have the Precambrian, and then we have the Cambrian is right here, but Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic. Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic. So most of Earth's most of Earth's history is here, and we know very little. Uh, you can see after the Cambrian, 
so the Cambrian, the big, the big uh, development was fish. Fish. So if there's fish, the oldest fish are in the Cambrian. If we find older fish, this date, this 542 million year date for the beginning of the Cambrian will be changed to reflect reality. So as we discover, as we make new discoveries, these dates shift. And that's the way science works. When there's new ideas that are proven to be better than old ideas, the new ideas are adopted. So we have fish, diversification of animal life, vascular plants, plants with veins instead of little single-celled plants, amphibians like frogs, reptiles later, also trees. Then we get different reptiles, the dinosaurs and the mammals show up, dinosaurs diversify, dinosaurs get whacked right here, the KT boundary or KPG boundary, the mammals take off. Uh, let's take a look at another version of the geologic timescale. This is the big bad boy. This is it. This is the Geologic Society of America's geologic timescale. Uh, and I don't really like it. It's way too detailed. But I wanted to show you that it exists. There's way more, way more information. Oh, and this over on the side is magnetic anomalies. We haven't really talked about that. We'll talk about this in this chapter is the idea that Earth's magnetic field flip-flops and goes from normal to reverse to normal to reverse on this sort of random scale. So here's another one. This is another artist's rending of the geologic time scale. Down here at the bottom, we have the formation of Earth. And you can see, so from, from the beginning to 2.5, that's, that's 2 billion years of Earth's history right there. We don't know a whole lot about it. Uh, one of the things that I would hope that you notice is the dates get closer and closer together. Like the Pleistocene, here it says 1.8. This is an example of what I was talking about. Between the time that this diagram was uh, created and the present, they've changed the beginning date for the Pleistocene from 1.8 to 2.5 million years ago. So still, it's about 2.5 million years in here uh, from 5.3 to 2.5, the Pliocene. So 23 to 5 million. So you're looking at 17 million years here. As you go back... For example, right here, going from 542 million years to 2.5 million, from 2.5 to 4.6. As, as we go back farther in Earth's history, we know less and less and less about it. I, I like this, uh, this geologic time scale. It's more whimsical than the other ones. Oh, right. Uh, so this is an artist's impression of an event that happened 66.4 million years ago when an asteroid about six miles across, traveling about 100,000 miles an hour, smacked into the Yucatan Peninsula off of Mexico with enough energy to ignite global forest fires that wiped out the majority of species on the planet. You can go all over the world and find evidence of this impact event. This is the KT or KPG impact event that wiped out the dinosaurs. Here we have older rock as you get up to the surface, younger and younger rock. And right here is the boundary layer with a layer of clay. Here we have a different picture of a different place on Earth where you can see the boundary layer with clay, the impact layer with glass balls made of fused Earth, and then a layer on top of the high concentration of iridium, which is common in objects from outer space. It's rare in objects found on Earth, though. So that's one of the lines of evidence that helps us know that the object came from outer space. Here we've got a sediment core. So going back to the last chapter on climate change, this is a sediment core taken from the middle of the ocean someplace. You can see before the impact, we have older rocks, the moment of impact. We have glass balls condensed from the hot vapor cloud that was rock. So it hit with enough energy to actually melt and then vaporize rock. There was actually vaporized rock that condensed out and made these little glass balls that rained down all over Earth. There's a fireball layer that has a high concentration of dust and ash, which is how we know there was fires, and then different species. So we had many, many different species. They were large. They were very complex foraminifera in the oceans. And then after the impact, we see a change in the distribution of species. They're smaller. They're simpler. There's fewer different types of foraminifera after the extinction event. This is the tree of life. Going back to the last universal common ancestor, as evolution took place, 
We got bacteria for starters, archaea, eukaryotes, plants, fungi, protosomes, and kinodermata, the spiny skin things like starfish. We have fish and sharks. Here we have fish, sharks, amphibians, birds, mammals here at the end. And there's these concentric rings of different mass extinctions. And you can see the evidence of the mass extinctions as these family trees get pruned. Like coming up here, whatever the heck that was, they don't exist anymore. Whatever was growing along there doesn't exist anymore. So you can see these white lines that represent, let me zoom in a bit. You can see where the family tree gets pruned and then it branches back out and then it gets pruned and it branches back out. It's happened again and again and again in Earth's history. If you look here, here's the end of the uh, dinosaurs. You can see they go extinct, which allows birds to flourish, also allows mammals to really take off. So the tree of life, geologic time. When we're looking at geologic time, there's two ways of dating it. There's absolute time, which is dating things with numbers. How long before the present? And there's relative time. And we're looking at this layer of rock is older than this other layer of rock. Radiometric dating, like uh, potassium argon or uranium to lead, those are examples of radio, radiometric dating techniques that will tell us how old rocks are. Relative dating is based on the relative to position of rock layers. And the principle of superposition, which is the idea that the oldest rocks are at the bottom and younger rocks get deposited on top. Youngest rocks are on top unless tectonic activity has turned them over. So here we've got a diagram of some of the rock layers in the Grand Canyon. And I've included a link to a really interesting, interesting, interesting. There's a big gap. There's like a billion years that are missing. You can see the rocks down here are tilted and older. And then they got shaved off. And then rocks, new, totally different rocks were deposited horizontally on top of those older rocks, the Uncar group. So let's take a look at these rocks in the, in the Grand Canyon, the Hermit Shale, the Supai Group, the Redwall, Limestone. In terms of absolute time, so if we were going to look at these rocks in terms of absolute time, here's the kind of thing that we would say. We'd say the Supai Group is 285 to 318 million years old. We'd say the Redwall Limestone is 318 to 359 million years old. So again, absolute time, just how many years old is it? So if we look at these rocks in terms of relative time, we'd say the Hermit Shale is on top of the Supai group, and therefore it's younger. The Hermit Shale is younger than the Supai group. The Supai group is on top of the Redwall Limestone, so then we could say the Supai group is younger than the Redstone, the Redwall Limestone, and the Redwall Limestone is the oldest of the Redwall Supai Hermit Shale. The oldest would be the Vishnu Schist, which is down here at the very bottom, and the youngest would be the Kaibab Formation up here on top. So relative time is how old is that relative to something else? Part of, part, of, part of earth science is the idea of uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism is the idea the present is the key to the past. It is the scientific idea that processes going on right now, like gravity, how fast do rivers run? How fast do things fall? How much does the ocean wear away at rocks on the shore? All of those processes have been happening at the same speed throughout Earth's history, that we have a very old, very slow Earth. The same physical processes active in the environment today have been operating throughout geologic time at the same speed. So Earth is, uh, looks like a big jawbreaker. Earth condensed from a cloud of dust, gas, and icy comets about 4.6 billion years ago. Western Australia has the oldest rocks. Uh, we saw a picture of some of those from the New Jack Formation. Earth is powered by the breakdown, the radioactive decay of elements in the core. So one of the things that scientists realized in the 60s and 70s is that Earth is powered internally. The continents are being driven by these convection currents in the mantle. The convection currents in the mantle are powered by Earth's internal heat. So Earth in cross-section looks like a very, very complicated candy. There's the core, it's made of the inner core and the outer core. 
The inner core is solid iron. The outer core is molten iron. The outer core is actually hotter than the inner core, but because of the enormous pressure on the inner core, the inner core is solid iron. There's the mantle. The mantle is made up of solid rock, although it does move slowly over long periods of time. And there's the crust. The material at the very outside layer of Earth is crust. Crust is also solid rock. And there's the lithosphere. So we have these four layers. We've got the core made up of the inner and outer core. We've got the mantle. The mantle is made up of four more layers. We have the crust made up of oceanic crust and continental crust. And then we have the lithosphere, which is all the rocky material on top of the asthenosphere. The lithosphere is also solid rock. So we have the core. The core is made up of the inner core and the outer core. The inner core is solid iron. The outer core is liquid, liquid molten metallic iron. On top of the core, we have the mantle, and the mantle is made up of four layers. They're all solid rock. There's the lower mantle, the upper mantle, the asthenosphere, and the uppermost mantle. Those four layers together make up the mantle. Uppermost mantle, the asthenosphere, the upper mantle, and the lower mantle. The asthenosphere, here it's labeled plastic. I think of the asthenosphere as the gooey caramel layer. This is the layer that flows and moves and takes with it the lithosphere. The lithosphere is all the rocky material made up of the uppermost mantle, so part of the mantle, and then the crust, continental and oceanic. Those two or three layers together, oceanic crust, continental crust, and the lithosphere, again, those are all solid rock, and they are moved by the plastic asthenosphere. Plastic, again, I think of it as the gooey caramel layer, like if you imagine... Caramel, that's pretty much the way this flows. It, it's kind of a solid if you look at it. Like if you hit caramel, it's not going to move a whole lot, but if you slowly push on it, it'll move a lot. So those are the eight layers. The inner core, the outer core make up the core. The mantle is made up of the lower, upper, asthenosphere, and uppermost mantle. So those four layers. The crust is made up of continental continental crust and oceanic crust. And then the lithosphere is a grouping of all the rocky material, the uppermost mantle and the crust on top of the asthenosphere. So everything on top of the asthenosphere, these three layers are the lithosphere. Here's another version. I like this one because it looks all bitchin'. Uh, Earth isn't really glowing, glowing like that on the inside. We've got the inner core, just solid iron, the outer core, liquid iron, the mantle, which makes up 80% of earth by volume, the mantle, and then the crust, which is very, very, very thin. Uh, the deepest part of the crust is about 70 kilometers below the surface. Earth's magnetic field is created by the movement of the outer core. Here's lines of magnetic force. This is why the northern lights, as the energy comes from the sun, the energy gets concentrated at the north and south poles, making the aurora borealis and the aurora australis. But that magnetic field changes over time. Oh, this is just showing density. I don't know why I included that. Here's an important weird idea. The densest part of Earth is the inner core. When Earth was molten, the dense material was pulled to the center. Earth's crust is the fluffiest material on Earth. Uh, granite, for example, very, very, very uh, heavy rock, but it is some of the least dense rock on Earth. It is the, the fluffy stuff that rose to the top while Earth was still relatively molten. Those magnetic reversals are preserved in igneous rock. So rock that used to be molten is igneous rock, rock associated with volcanic eruptions. That's magma, which cools to become igneous rock. So as the rock is heated, the magnetic field of the molecules lines up with Earth's magnetic field. When the rock cools, the magnetic field of the molecules gets locked in place. So... If we look at rocks, if we look at old rocks, for example, rocks along the Reykjanes Ridge, we see this pattern of normal. The red would be normal. The purple would be reversed polarity. So if you had a compass and you were alive on Earth at this time, the time that these purple rocks were being formed, the North Pole and your compass would point to Antarctica. And then we've got the blue 
That's going to be normal polarity. It's going to point at the North Pole. Green, if you're around during this time, you'd be your compass would be pointing at the South Pole again. This was incredibly important evidence for plate tectonics, that scientists could date the rock, so we know how old the rock is, so we know how far the plate has moved. So we know how fast the plates are spreading apart at the spreading center. We know how old they are. And we also know the magnetic orientation of Earth's magnetic field looking at igneous rocks. Here is a longer record of Earth's magnetic field, the Brunus Cron. The blue or turquoise, whatever color this is, is normal, reversed, normal, reversed, normal, reversed, normal, reversed. You can see it's random. It's not like every 500,000 years. Some reversals last a little bit. Some last a long time. It's poorly understood, which I think is really, really interesting. But there's agreement all over Earth. So if you found rock that was 2 billion years old, it would be uh, it would have negative polarity. 1 billion, it would have normal. In between 1 billion and 3 quarters of a billion, it would be reversed normal, reversed, all over the world. So the mantle is hot, mostly solid material. It does move with these convection cells. The mantle represents 80% of Earth's total volume. Again, driven by convection currents. Here we can see, not the greatest diagram, but you can see the convection currents in the mantle. Here we have the lithosphere. The lithosphere would then be oceanic crust and uppermost mantle. The gooey asthenosphere, which is moving even faster than the mantle. Closer to the surface in the mantle, the temperature and pressure are less, and so the rocks are more rigid. And when put under stress, they tend to break as opposed to deeper rocks. Those are going to be hotter and under more pressure and they flow. They will bend. In fact, a good way of thinking of it is like chocolate chip cookies. If they're straight out of the oven and they're still warm, you can bend them. So that would be the deeper, deeper rocks in the mantle. But once those cookies cool, when you try to bend them, they just break. That would be rock that's closer to the surface because it's not as hot and there's less pressure on it. The asthenosphere is from 70 kilometers below the surface to about 250 kilometers. It's plastic. It flows like caramel. The lithosphere is the uppermost mantle and then crust, either oceanic or continental or both. The lithosphere is moved by the asthenosphere. It's broken into about 14 major plates. We'll take a look at that later. The Mohorovicic discontinuity, or moho, separates the crust from the mantle. Above the moho is the crust. The rocky shell of the continents and the ocean floor, that would be the lithosphere. The crust is going to be made up of oceanic crust. Oceanic crust is chemically very similar to basalt. Basalt has a lot of iron and magnesium. It has a density of 3 grams per cubic centimeter. That's going to be very important, and it helps us understand why plate tectonics works the way it does. That oceanic crust is more dense than continental crust that we'll see in a minute. So when two plates come together, if one of them is oceanic crust and the other plate is continental crust, the continental crust will make the oceanic subduct. The oceanic crust is darker and it's more dense, so it's going to slip under the continental crust. Oceanic crust, again, higher in iron and magnesium. It's about five kilometers thick. So if you just started walking straight down, after an hour, you would have walked about three miles. You could have walked through all of Earth's crust, or at least oceanic crust. Oceanic crust, about five kilometers thick. Continental crust is much thicker. It's also less dense. Oceanic crust, and this is important, and I'll come to it, come back to it again and again and again. Oceanic crust flows like motor oil when it melts. Continental crust, chemically, it's similar to granite. It has more silica, more aluminum. It is less dense. It has a density of 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter. So it floats, if you will, on top of oceanic crust. If they come into contact, if they collide, the oceanic crust is going to go down. 
because it's more dense. The continental crust is high in silicon and aluminum. And when it melts out 20 to 60 kilometers thick, it's thicker. The thickest crust we're going to find with the highest mountains. So Mount Everest would be some of the thickest crust on the planet. When continental crust melts, when it's molten, like in a volcano, it flows like mashed potatoes. It is very thick, very, very, very thick. Volcanoes that are made of continental crust tend to just explode. We'll talk about that when we get to volcanoes. The rock cycle. So let's talk about the rock cycle. The rock cycle is how we get new rocks. It's what happens to old rocks it's an example. We can use the rock cycle to help us understand exogenic and endogenic. Again, internal processes are endogenic. They tend to build up landforms. External processes, exogenic processes like weathering and erosion tend to wear down those landforms. So another way of thinking of these two competing forces is one of them tends to build up new landforms. Endogenic volcanoes and earthquakes tend to build up new landforms, and weathering and erosion tends to just wear them down over time. Here we've got a diagram of the geologic cycle, which includes the hydrologic cycle, the water cycle, washing stuff into the ocean to make new sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rock can get subducted by the tectonic cycle that will then melt and make new igneous rocks. So the geologic cycle includes the water cycle, the rock cycle, going back and forth between sedimentary, igneous, and metamorphic rocks, and then the tectonic cycle moving the plates around. So again, the geologic cycle is just made up of the rock cycle, the tectonic cycle, and the hydrologic cycle. There are some rocks, if you like rocks. Sedimentary rock is made up of sediment. Igneous rock is rock that used to be molten. And metamorphic rock is rock that has been changed by heat or pressure. It could have been igneous, could have been sedimentary, could have even been metamorphic rock. But if it's altered by heat, by compression, or... Uh, if it's, yeah, by heat or pressure, then it becomes metamorphic rock. Metamorphic rock is usually harder and more resistant to weathering. So metamorphic rock would tend to stick around, would be uh, worn away more slowly. So uh, here's a really weird idea. Earth is, in terms of the materials it's made of, not very diverse. Only eight elements uh, make up 99% of Earth's crust. And of those eight, oxygen makes up about half. About half the weight of Earth's crust is oxygen. This is really, really interesting. Oxygen combines readily with other chemicals. That's why when you leave tools out overnight, they rust because oxygen is combining with the iron to make iron oxide. This is what happened with rocks on Earth. In fact, people who are looking for extraterrestrial life are often just looking for oxygen in the atmosphere. If there's oxygen in the atmosphere, something is making it because otherwise all the oxygen in the atmosphere would get bound up with rocks by oxidation. So if there's oxygen in the atmosphere, something's making it. And at this point, the only process, this, the only process that we're aware of that makes oxygen would be photosynthesis, which is life. So oxygen makes up about half the weight of Earth's crust. Silicon makes up about a quarter of the weight of Earth's crust. So about three quarters of Earth's crust is just oxygen and silicon, which is incredibly interesting because SiO2 is the chemical symbol for quartz, which is found in beach sand. So the chemical formula of beach sand, two parts oxygen, one part silicon, is about the same as the makeup of most of Earth's crust. Rocks are made of minerals, and a mineral is an inorganic natural substance with a chemical formula and a crystalline, crystalline structure. So if it has a chemical formula, it's a crystalline structure, it is a mineral, rocks are made of minerals. Rocks are made of minerals. Yeah, igneous rock is rock that used to be molten. It can get ground up and weathered and transported and become sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rock can get subducted and become metamorphic rock, which can wear away and become sedimentary rock, which can get subducted and become igneous rock. It just goes around and around. Igneous rock melts under high temperature. Igneous rocks are divided up into intrusive that cool inside the crust and extrusive that cool outside the crust. They cool externally. 
And you can tell the difference because as the rock cools, if it cools slowly, there will be time for visible minerals, mineral crystals to form. If it cools quickly, there isn't time for those crystals to form. Magma is under the ground. If it's, uh, yeah, you can't fall into molten hot magma. You could fall into molten hot lava. If it's at the surface, it's lava. If it's below the ground, it's magma. Here we have granite, basalt, rhyolite, three, three igneous rocks. The basalt would be an extrusive rock. It's, sorry about that. The basalt would be an extrusive rock. It's going to cool very quickly. The granite is an intrusive rock. It cools internally very slowly, and that's why you get that salt and pepper appearance of granite, because the rock cooled slowly enough for the crystals have time, the crystals had time to grow before they cooled. So igneous rocks make up about 90% of Earth's crust. So the mantle makes up about 80% of Earth's volume, but igneous rocks make up most of Earth's crust. Continental crust is light colored. It's low in density. It's similar to granite. When it melts, it makes explosive volcanoes. Oceanic crust is more dense. It's darker color. It's chemically similar to basaltic rock. When it melts, it flows like motor oil. Sedimentary rock forms from sediments from older rocks. You can divide sedimentary rocks into three different classes. There's clastic, made up of broken bits of other rocks. Organic sedimentary rocks made up of organic materials, so limestone from dead microorganisms in the ocean would be an organic sedimentary rock. Coal is another organic sedimentary rock. And then you can get chemical sedimentary rocks formed when uh, different chemicals precipitate out of water and then settle to the bottom and make rocks. Example of sedimentary rocks. Metamorphic rocks are changed by heat or pressure. Like I said before, it often makes them harder, more resistant to weathering. So it's harder for natural forces to break them down and get rid of them. The two types of metamorphic processes are regional metamorphism. So in plate tectonics, when you have two plates that are colliding with each other, that would be regional metamorphism. And contact metamorphism, when magma rising to the surface cooks rocks by contact. So if you had two continents that were colliding, that would be regional metamorphism. If you have molten magma and it cooks the surrounding non-molten rocks, that would be contact metamorphism. The Taj Mahal is made of marble, which is a metamorphic, metamorphic rock made of limestone, a sedimentary rock. So if you take limestone, the sedimentary rock, and you heat it, and you compress it, you get marble, which is harder and more resistant to being worn away. Ah... Plate tectonics. So enough about the rock cycle. Let's talk about plate tectonics. There's my man, Alfred Lothar Wegener. He proposed the idea of continental drift in 1912. He was ridiculed. He was mocked because of a couple things. Number one, he was a meteorologist, not a geologist. So the geologists were envious of somebody coming in and telling them what, <laughs> what their science was about. And he also didn't have a mechanism. He, he had outstanding evidence. He had geologic evidence. He had fossil evidence. He looked at the fit of continental margins. The evidence that, that Wegener had for continental drift, what, what he called continental drift, and we now call plate tectonics, his evidence was great, but he had no mechanism. So he couldn't explain how the continents were moving. And so people rejected his ideas. Right up until the 1960s. In the 1960s, there was a flood of data, and the data all supported each other and led to the rapid, rapid adoption of plate tectonics. Plate tectonics was as huge for geology as evolution was for biology. It, it explained so many things overnight, overnight, so many earthquakes, volcanoes, mountains, valleys, all of it made sense. The distribution of earthquakes, we'll, we'll look at that in just a minute. So here we have 220 million years ago. This was Pangaea. We've got North America, South America, Africa, India, Australia, Antarctica, Eurasia. And then it breaks up. Here we have Earth today.
So this is an animation done by a guy named Christopher Scotese, and Christopher Scotese does animations of play tectonics, does some of the best. Here's a weird idea. Pangea was just the most recent time that the continents had come together, that every 300, 400 million years, the continents jam together and make a new supercontinent, and they break apart, and they come together and they break apart, break apart, come together, break apart. So that's been going on throughout Earth's history. So Pangea is just the most recent assemblage of all the continents when they were together. And if we move this up a little bit, 300 million years ago. And I've included a link to this. I, I really suggest that you take a look, enjoy it, back it up, run it forward. So here we've got Pangea. Here's North America. Here's Africa, South America. Antarctica, India, Australia, Eurasia. And as we move forward, you'll see a couple of cool things. India is going to break off and rush up, just blow past, blow past Africa and ram into China. We're about to see the opening of the North Atlantic. So we we're here we are about 160 million years ago. The Atlantic is opening up. And now we've got Africa and South America breaking off from Australia, 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 and India, and Antarctica. 120 million years ago, 110 million years ago. So here you can see India. India is going to break off. Here's Australia. But yeah, compare the speed of India to the speed of Africa to the speed of Australia. It's like India really, really has issues with China. So now we're coming up on 60 million years ago. So this is the, this is the way Earth looked about the time the dinosaurs got whacked. Here is where the impact would have occurred off the Yucatan Peninsula. If we keep going got India. About 40 million years ago or so is about when contact was made between the Indian plate and the uh, Asian subcontinent. Now we have the uplift of the Himalayas, which is going to expose limestone, a sedimentary rock. As limestone weathers, it absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. That cooled the planet, we think, the massive exposure of the Tibetan plateau beginning about 40 million years ago. By 30 million years, things were looking more recognizable. There's some weird sea level things. For example, here, this is, this is dry land now. Well, no, it's ocean now, but 10 million years ago, it was dry land. And we're going to come up on the last ice age. So at the last ice age, this was dry land. You could walk all the way out of Asia down into Indonesia. You could walk from Australia to Papua New Guinea. That was dry land. You couldn't. There was a, a deep water channel that separated the two. Uh, uh, there was no, was no English channel. You could walk from France to England. So that brings us up to today. Uh, here is some of the evidence that Wegener looked at. He looked at the distribution of fossils. So we've got a freshwater reptile found across South America and Africa, a land reptile found across South America and Africa, another land reptile found across Africa, India, and Antarctica, and then this tree fern or a glossopterous fern found across Australia, Antarctica, India, Africa, and South America. And the distribution of these doesn't make sense if you look at where the continents are today. Like, how do you get a freshwater reptile found in Africa and South America because they can't swim in salt water or they die? Well, if you put the continents together in the shape that they were at when that animal was alive, it was a contiguous distribution. It was all dry land. So the continental margin fit, this is the sea level margin. If we were looking at the actual fit of the continents, they would have fit much, much better than this. This is just the sea level fit, not the actual continental margin fit based on the type of crust. So Wegener had fossil evidence. He had great fossil evidence. He had paleoclimatic evidence. So the white areas, there's evidence of big ice sheets across Australia and India. 
across Madagascar, plates that are now tropical, we've got ice sheets, and we have places that used to be tropical swamps that are no longer tropical swamps. They're not in the tropics, parts of Europe, uh, parts of parts of uh, North America were tropical swamps, but they're no longer in the tropics. But if you put the continents back to where they were when those rocks were being formed, then you have tropical swamps in the tropics. You've got glacial areas at the poles. Another diagram showing the distribution of glaciated areas in the past, and if you put the continents together, and then where those, where those same glaciated areas are today. So we have plates, lithospheric plates made of crust and uppermost mantle floating on the asthenosphere. The good stuff mostly happens at the boundaries between the plates, where they're either getting pulled apart, making a new boundary, or at the edges of two plates where they come together. That's where you're going to get earthquakes, that's where you're going to get mountains and volcanoes. There's 14 plates. We have an upwelling of magma from some places. The plates spread out and then they sink at other places, forming earthquakes, volcanoes, folding, faulting, warping of rocks. Here we've got a map of the different plates. Some of the plates, like the Pacific plate, are just oceanic crust. Some of them, like the North American, South American, African, and Eurasian plates, are a combination of continental and oceanic crust, but they move as one big plate, they move as one big plate, they move as one big plate. The arrows indicate the direction of movement of the plates. So, for example, Africa is going up into Eurasia. India is still crashing into China. The Atlantic is getting bigger, the Pacific is getting smaller, so all the places that look like cold fronts, those are convergent boundaries where two plates are coming together. In this case, the Nazca Plate is getting stuffed under South America, melting and then making volcanoes. Here we have another cross-section showing the mantle, the asthenosphere, and then the lithosphere. So here's the South American Plate, made up of continental and oceanic crust. There's a spreading center, a spreading center, the mid-oceanic ridge, where new material's coming up, so the Atlantic is getting bigger, the Pacific is getting smaller. Here we have subduction going on. This is the Thing Valley, the Thinger Valley in Iceland, where it's actually, the continent is actually getting ripped apart. Iceland sits on top of one of these spreading centers, and so it's actually getting, getting pulled apart. Oh my god, this map. This, this is the uh, Marie Tharp map made by Marie Tharp in the 1960s. This was another important evidence for plate tectonics that before this map existed, scientists thought that the floor of the ocean would be totally smooth. They knew that Earth was old. They knew that material had been washing off the continents for billions of years. And so scientists figured that the ocean would have been filled up with dirt. But... Oceanic crust is some of the youngest crust on the planet. Uh, the oldest oceanic crust that we can find is about 280 million years old. Right here along the mid-oceanic ridge, it's brand new. So that would be some of the youngest crust would be along the mid-oceanic ridge. Oceanic crust is still among the younger material on the planet, the oldest that we've got. I think it's found in the Mediterranean, about 280 million years old. As opposed to the age of rocks, uh, the Canadian Shield is over 3 billion years old. Those rocks in Australia are 4 billion years old. So we're talking 4,000 million years as opposed to it's being formed this morning. You can also see the Great Trenches. Great Trenches. Great Trenches where two plates are coming together. So the Pacific, all around the Pacific Ring of Fire, because new material is coming up here, Earth isn't getting any bigger, so for every centimeter of new material, someplace else, a centimeter of material is going to have to subduct and melt. Just absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous math. This, uh, she was mansplained. She had to do the math and prove to male scientists again and again and again that her analysis was in fact correct, and it was. Just absolutely gorgeous cartography and scientifically incredibly important. So this is showing just the red line, uh, those are the boundaries between two different plates. So this is the North American plate, the South American plate, the Nazca plate. Here's the outlines of the plates themselves. Now we've got, we're differentiating plate boundaries. The yellow are convergent boundaries where two plates are coming together. 
The red are where they're coming apart, and the blue, they're just grinding past each other horizontally. This is the distribution of volcanoes. Let me back that up. There you go. So this is one of the things that geologists were thrilled about. Oh, the volcanoes, there's a relationship between volcanoes and the plate tectonic boundaries, for example. Convergent, 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 convergent. These are earthquakes. Again, same deal. Earthquakes and plate boundaries. The vast majority of the earthquakes are happening where two boundaries are coming into contact with each other, either crushing into each other, grinding past each other, or getting pulled apart. This is showing the ages of crust in 20 million year chunks. So 0 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80. 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120 million years old. So the width tells you how fast that plate is moving. Like because this is the red is 0 to 20, you can see that right here, the plates have moved a lot farther apart than they have right here. So by looking at the age of different, different areas of crust, it'll tell us how fast the crust has been moving. This is a phenomenal website. This is Seismic Explorer. Uh, I'm going to recommend I included a link. Let's just open it up and see what happens. So we can watch earthquakes in real time as they bubble along from 1980 to the present. And there's all kinds of amazing, amazing, amazing things that we can look at. I was going to say, I'm hoping it's just going to stop. So the colors indicate the depth, how deep the earthquakes are. So those red earthquakes are with a, along divergent plate boundaries, where the plate boundaries are moving apart. Over here, we have a convergent boundary. So what's happening is this plate, in fact, let's draw a cross section from here across here. There? Yeah, that'll work. So we can actually see what we're seeing is a descending plate. This would be the Nazca plate getting subducted. This would be the uh, South American plate. We can see that the earthquakes are steadily getting deeper and deeper and deeper, and then they stop as they melt. At some point, the plates actually are melted, and so uh, there's no more earthquake. There's, no, there's nothing to fight. There's no resistance. So those were earthquakes. We can also take a look at volcanoes. I wish they had a reset button for this, but so we've got volcanoes, 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 and again at those plate boundaries. So we've got a plate boundary here with two plates colliding. We've got volcanoes, 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 volcanoes. Here we've got Mount Lassen, Mount Shasta, the Cascades, Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, Mount Baker, Mount Cook, all the way up into Alaska. Then from Alaska, the Aleutians, into the Kamchatka Peninsula, down into Japan, into the Marianas Trench, the deepest part of the ocean, the Philippines. So again, you can see a trench, a convergent boundary in Indonesia, and also some places at divergent boundaries. So here in Africa, this is the Rift Valley. It's actually getting pulled apart, creating this whole chain of volcanoes in Africa as Africa gets pulled apart. So that was the Seismic Explorer. I really, really hope that you, uh, that was the Seismic Explorer. I really hope that you uh, take the time to play around with that a bit and enjoy it. So let's look at the three types of plate boundaries. We've got divergent boundaries where they're coming apart. This would be along the mid-oceanic ridge. Iceland is plopped right on top of one of these areas with a divergent boundary. Seafloor spreading would be a divergent boundary. 
Convergent boundaries are where the two plates are coming together. So this was the way California looked about 80 to 120 million years ago with the Pacific plate subducting under the North American plate. This is the way South America looks right now. In fact, that's just what we were looking at was a cross section of this showing where the earthquakes were. On top, there's volcanoes because the rock, the plate melts and then bubbles up. The Pacific plate would have been melting its way up through the North American plate. So divergent, convergent, seafloor spreading, all of the red areas with the baby crust. This is another map of age of oceanic crust, age of oceanic crust. You can see the Pacific opening up quickly compared to the Atlantic. Subduction is when one plate, when two plates come together, one of them usually will sink. The oceanic crust is more dense, so the oceanic crust will sink or subduct. Oceanic crust has a density of 3 grams per cubic centimeter. Continental crust has a density of 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter. So here we've got, in fact, we were just looking at the Aleutian Trench, the Aleutian Trench with the Pacific plate subducting under the North American plate, creating a line of volcanoes, a line of volcanoes. The Aleutian, the Aleutian Islands are a string of volcanoes being formed by subduction. So plate motion is complex. There's ridge push and slab pull. I've included this video. I'm not going to show it now. Uh, I would take a minute, go find the slides, watch the video on plate tectonics. It does a much better job of explaining it than I can, but it's both. There's new material coming up at the ridge, pushing the plates apart, but then the old slab, because this is brand new, this is going to be hotter. And as it moves away and gets older, it gets cooler and cooler and cooler. As it gets cooler, it becomes more dense. And so it sinks and pulls the slab with it. So the, the slabs, the plates are getting pushed apart at the ridges that are getting pulled down at the edges. I think I mentioned before the interactions at divergent boundaries where they're being pulled apart or convergent where they're colliding or transform when they're grinding past each other. Those are the three places that you really get uh, things like earthquakes, volcanoes, mountain building. So I've included some animations for you. I would click through, take a look at those. What's the first one? Transform plate boundary. Okay. Here we've got a transform boundary. So you can't have a transform boundary without a divergent boundary. So this is supposed to be along the mid-oceanic ridge. Here's the mid-oceanic ridge. When you look at a picture of the mid-oceanic ridge, you'll notice that there's all these offset sections. There's these cracks. So if this was the ridge, there's these cracks that run 90 degrees relative to the, to the ridge. So they're perpendicular to the ridge with these offsets. And because new material is coming up here, We've got new material coming up. There you go. New material coming up, new material coming up. In this section, they're just grinding past each other horizontally. So that is the transform fault right there. And it's caused again by the offsets along the divergent plate boundary. So you can't have transform faults without a divergent boundary. So I would take a look at the transform plate boundary animation, some good stuff in there. Three types of plates, again, divergent, convergent, and transform plate boundaries at the edges. And here's what I was talking about. So this, in fact, right here is the offset. This is the Mendocino Triple Junction, where the North American plate and the Juan de Fuca and the Pacific plate all come together. But these, these east, uh, yeah, right, left, east, west running lines, those are all transform faults along the spreading center. Earthquakes and volcanoes happening at plate boundaries. Subduction, subducting plates melt and then bubble their way up through the other crust, creating the Pacific Ring of Fire. Here we've got another diagram from the book showing distribution of earthquakes, the little dots, and volcanoes shown as the little triangles. Not all volcanoes take place at plate boundaries, though. Some of them occur in the middle of the plate, and those are called hotspots. 
the best example of a hotspot where you have an upwelling of mantle to the surface would be the Hawaiian Islands. So the big island of Hawaii is the youngest. Parts of it are being formed as we speak. And as you move off the hotspot, they get older. Maui, about a million. Molokai, about two. Oahu, about three million. Kauai, about five million. So of the, of the big Hawaiian islands, Kauai is the oldest at just over five million years old. Here you can see the Hawaiian seamount chain and the Emperor seamount chain. The oldest, the oldest mountains in the Emperor seamount chain are about 80 million years old. These are about 40 million years old. These are being formed this morning. So you can see that the plate is moving in this direction. The hot spot, we think, has stayed in the same place over time, but the plate is moving on top of the hot spot. Here's a diagram showing what's happening. So the hotspot is stays in plate, and the Pacific plate, the lithosphere, all the crusty stuff on top of the asthenosphere, is getting moved along to the northwest. Okay, let's talk about more plate tectonics. Plate tectonics can change the shape of the surface of the Earth. That's why we have mountains. That's why we have valleys. So stress affects rock by deforming it. There's three types of stress. There's tension, which stresses rock, which stretches rock. Tension is pulling. Compression, pushing, shortens rock. And shear, uh, like the two blades of a scissors, when they, when they slide past each other, that's an example of shearing. So here's the three types of, the three types of stress. We've got tension, compression, and shear stress. Those three types of stress will create earthquake faults, three types of faults, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Rocks either bend or break. Deep, warm rocks, uh, we were talking about this earlier, like chocolate chip cookies, warm cookies bend, cold cookies break. It works the same way with rock. Shallow, colder rocks are brittle. Deep, warm rocks bend, they're ductile. Folding. When two continents are coming together, you can get folding. The crust gets shorter and folded. Here's an example of folding. This is from Humboldt. I thought this was really impressive because these rocks were bent more than 90 degrees. And then when I walked down the coast, I found that these rocks had been bent almost 180 degrees, that this layer had been laid down horizontally and then folded back on itself. This is laid down horizontally and then folded back, just like closing a book. Here's some more amazing chevron folds from compression. This is in Namibia, and another example of folding. Another example of folding. This one much sharper. Another example of folding. I think this is in Crete. Another example of folding. Some really impressive, amazing folds. All right, let's talk about faulting. So faulting leads to earthquakes. There's uh, three types of faults. There's normal faults, which are caused by tension, reverse, fault, reverse faults caused by compression, and then strike slip or transform faults caused by shear stress. So let's take a look at these. One of the fun things about earthquakes, or faults rather, is if you know what the stress is, if you know that, for example, if you know that the rocks are getting pulled apart, then you would expect to find normal faults. And if you find normal faults, that tells you that the rock is being pulled apart by tension. So the side that hangs over is called the hanging wall. The other wall is called the foot wall. With tension, the two sides get pulled apart, and the hanging wall is actually going to drop down. So if the hanging wall drops down, that's normal for the hanging thing to drop down. The hanging thing drops down, that's normal. That's a normal fault caused by tension. The opposite of tension would be compression. Compression would make a reverse fault where the hanging wall goes up. So these two, as they're compressed together, the hanging wall is going to go up. That's a reverse fault. So here again, we have a normal fault with the hanging wall dropped down caused by tension. Here is a reverse fault where they've been shoved together. This layer of rock and this layer of rock would have been at the same level. But you can see this rock, as they've come together, has been shoved up. I don't know, is that 20, 40 feet? 
And then a strike slip is when they're just grinding past each other horizontally, such as the San Andreas Fault. Nobody's going up, nobody's going down. This is a right lateral fault. So if you were standing here, you can see that those rocks used to be over here, but they've moved to the right. So if I was here, I'd look over here and say, oh, those have moved to my right. That's a right lateral fault. It's exactly the sort of fault. So if this was, if we were in San Francisco looking over at Oakland, Oakland is moving to our right. The San Andreas Fault is a right lateral strike slip fault. Oh, let's review. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures, and you can try to guess what type of fault this is. So this would be the hanging wall. That would be the foot wall. This is the hanging wall. This is the foot wall. So this has dropped down. The hanging wall has dropped down caused by tension, so that would be a normal fault. You can see this layer of rock used to be at the same level as that, but it's gone up, which is the reverse of normal, so that's a reverse fault caused by compression. This is in Death Valley. These are micro faults. They are normal faults. The hanging wall has dropped down, so hanging wall on this side, foot wall, hanging wall, foot wall, foot wall, hanging wall. So here's the fault itself. This side has dropped down. This is the hanging wall. The hanging wall has dropped down, so it's another normal fault. This is another normal fault. Although you can see all kinds of other things. Uh, sedimentary rocks are laid down horizontally. So there's been all kinds of tectonic activity because you can see there's this layer, that layer, that layer, that layer. Those are all different layers of that layer, that layer. Those rocks would have all been horizontal when they were formed, and now they've been tipped up and also broken. Little tiny thrust fault. There's the, the fault itself. You can see this layer has gone up relative to that area. Clear, clearly there was more rock here back in the day, but it's gone now. Enough about faulting. Let's look at applied faulting and earthquakes. So with earthquake faults, the faults, the plates don't slide. They get stuck, but the pressure builds and builds until something breaks, and then they slip and grind and make an earthquake and get stuck, and the pressure builds until it breaks the rock. So that sharp release of energy results in a seismic wave, an earthquake. The theory that explains how rocks move is called the elastic rebound theory. We'll take a look at that. We'll take a look at that right now. I've included another handy dandy link to uh, the elastic rebound theory. So with the elastic rebound theory, it's pretty straightforward that the plates move and as the plates move, they will gradually deform and bend. That the rocks will deform under stress as the stress, sorry about that, the rocks will deform under stress, the stress will build and build and build until the rocks break. There's movement, and then the rocks snap back to their original shape. That's the elastic part. So elastic is a physics term for a substance that deforms under stress and returns to its original shape when the stress is relieved. So when there's stress on the rock, it bends. When that stress is relieved, it snaps back into its original shape. So here's some, uh, some animations to watch about the, the elastic rebound theory and how that works. Some keywords, the epicenter, you've all heard that, that's where the earthquake is at the surface, or rather the epicenter is the location at the surface directly above the focus, which is the subsurface location that the earthquake actually happened at. So the place where the earthquake happens is the focus, at the surface is the epicenter. You can remember that epidermis is your skin, the epicenter is on Earth's epidermis on the surface. So we've got a fault, we've got the focus is where it happens underground, the epicenter is at the surface, and then if there's a visible expression of the fault, that's called a fault scarp. Focus. Aftershocks and foreshocks. So if you when you have an earthquake, it's going to remove stress from part of the system 
but then as the stress gets moved around, it could accumulate someplace else that could create another earthquake, and that would be an aftershock. Seismographs are used to record the vibrations. So this is an actual seismogram of an earthquake. There are three scales that we're going to use to measure earthquakes. Each is going to measure something entirely different. So the modified Mercalli scale measures damage. The Richter scale measures the size of the seismic waves. The Richter scale was the first scientific scale that allowed scientists to compare different earthquakes, and that was huge. For the first time ever, scientists could compare how much energy was involved with earthquakes that happened in different places at different times. The most modern scale is the moment magnitude scale. That actually measures the energy released in the earthquake. The Richter scale measures the size of the waves, so all you need is a seismometer to record them, and then you measure how high the waves are. That tells you what it is on the Richter scale. The moment magnitude scale, you actually need to go out, look at the ground, and see how far things moved, and see how strong the rock was in order to figure out the moment magnitude scale was. So the mer modified Mercalli just measures damage. It uses Roman numerals going from 1 to 12. Insurance companies use it. Uh, measures from 1 to 12. Insurance companies use it. It's not scientific at all. It's just how much damage was done. The Richter scale was developed by Charles Richter of Caltech. It was the first quantitative scale that allowed scientists to compare how big an earthquake was to another earthquake. It is logarithmic, so every whole number increase going from a 1 to a 2 means that the waves were 10 times as big, and it means that 32 times more energy was released by that earthquake. Going from a magnitude 1 to a magnitude 3, the waves would be 100 times higher, and it would result in 32 times 32 times 32, 1,000 times more energy being released. Or, I'm sorry, 32 times 32. The moment magnitude scale is more accurate at measuring large earthquakes. It measures the energy released by the earthquake. You have to go out and look at how far the fault slipped, how, how large the surface area was where the fault was slipping. Larger surface area would require more energy to move. And how strong was the rock? Because what happens ultimately is the strength of the rock is overcome by the stress of the fault movement. So the stronger the rock, the more energy it would take to break it. The advantage of this is that you can compare more accurately similar large earthquakes, and you can also look at earthquakes that happened before there were seismometers. So because you actually have to go out and look at the fault and do some surveying, you can use it to figure out how big earthquakes were in the past when nobody was even around. It's also logarithmic. The numbers on the moment magnitude scale are very, very close to the numbers on the Richter scale. Earthquakes are impossible per to predict in the short term, and the long term, it's easy. There's a 100% chance there's going to be an earthquake on the San Andreas Fault in the next 100 years. When that's going to happen, we can't really say. Uh, nobody's been able to do it. Use paleoseismology is the term for looking at the history of plate boundaries and the history of earthquakes. There are obvious seismic risk zones based on plate tectonics, so convergent boundaries. In fact, it's going to be the convergent boundaries that are going to have the largest earthquakes. So the earthquake in Nepal, the earthquake in Chile, earthquake in Alaska, those are some of the largest earthquakes ever recorded. Those are all at convergent boundaries. The number of people killed in an earthquake depends on the size of the earthquake, the time of day, and what people's houses are made out of. So in California, we have a building code. The building code takes into account earthquakes. So in California, you have to build your house in order to withstand earthquakes. In other countries, especially countries, developing countries, where people have houses made of mud bricks, they tend to be crushed when the earthquake hits. The walls have no resistance to getting shoved over sideways, so the entire building collapses.
Some examples of big earthquakes, the Haiti earthquake in 2010 killed 300,000 people. The Tangshan earthquake in, in China killed around a quarter of a million people. We're not exactly sure how many were killed. Sumatra, the earthquake there, or rather the tsunami was responsible for killing the vast majority of those people. The black dots are magnitude 9 earthquakes, and they are all thrust quakes, where one plate is sliding horizontally under another, sliding horizontally, sliding horizontally, sliding horizontally, sliding horizontally. The largest earthquakes are, are at convergent boundaries, where there's predominantly horizontal movement of the crust. These are megathrust earthquakes. So Japan, Indonesia, Chile, Alaska, Nepal. So the uh, the difference between a reverse thrust or a reverse fault and a thrust fault is the thrust fault the movement is more only, is more horizontal. With the reverse fault the movement is more vertical. If the movement is more horizontal, like the Indian plate getting shoved more horizontally, that's a thrust fault. Again, another, another diagram showing the thrust fault with the Indian continent getting shoved under the Asian continent. The plates get stuck, the pressure builds, eventually they rip loose, and then you get an earthquake. Japan, following the 2012 earthquake, there was a massive tsunami, destroyed the Fukushima nuclear power plant. The 1989 magnitude 6.9 earthquake in Loma Prieta that stopped the World Series was a 6.9 magnitude earthquake and did not a whole lot of damage. Uh, it destroyed clearly the Nimitz bridge or the Nimitz section of the freeway. Um, but compared to other places that have had similar earthquakes, very few people were actually killed or injured because of our building codes. Enough about earthquakes. Let's talk about volcanoes. So globally, about 1,300 volcanoes, 600 of those are active, which means that they've erupted in the last 10,000 years. Most of the volcanoes are under the ocean, so we don't notice them. They're found at convergent boundaries, at subduction zones, because you have crust getting subducted, melting, then bubbling back up. You can divide them into explosive and effusive. So the location, just like real estate, the location is going to determine how that volcano behaves. So convergent boundaries and subduction zones, you get explosive volcanoes. Spreading centers and hot spots, you get effusive flowing volcanoes. Hot spots, you also get effusive flowing volcanoes. This is why people go to Hawaii to look at erupting volcanoes. Those are the hotspot volcanoes or seafloor spreading effusive volcanoes. They're relatively safe. They do not explode typically, as opposed to Cascadian volcanoes. They just explode. So Mount St. Helens, example of a Cascadian volcano, when it erupts, it just explodes without warning often. We have a general idea when it's going to erupt, but the exact timing is, is always, always exciting. So... Uh, let's look at different places that you could have volcanic activity. Subduction zone, explosive, subduction zone, explosive. Rifting, where the crust is getting pulled apart. For example, those pictures of uh, Africa, the Rift Valley in Africa. Effusive, getting pulled apart. This was uh, volcanic activity in much of the Pacific Northwest. The Columbia flood basalts. We'll look at those in a minute. I'll say, oh yeah, the flood basalts. The crust is getting pulled apart and you get basalt coming up. Uh, crust getting pulled apart, you get basalt effusive, 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 hotspot effusive, convergence, explosive, convergence, explosive. So just like, just like real estate, the type of activity is going to depend on the location. So low viscosity, very fluid magma, made of basalt, as opposed to the high viscosity, the slow moving, the thick, the explosive magma, that's going to be like granite. So continental crust, like granite, it's going to explode. Low viscosity, basalt, that's just going to ooze, it's going to flow like motor oil. Effusive eruptions are relatively gentle, 
low viscosity, very fluid magma, making very flat, boring earthquakes. I'm sorry, very flat, very boring volcanoes. You get shield volcanoes, like all of the Hawaiian Islands are shield volcanoes. They're very, very flat because the lava is so fluid. You can also get cinder cones on the sides of shield volcanoes. We'll look at some pictures of that. So let's take a look at an erupting Hawaiian volcano. There you go. So uh, as the magma gets close to the surface, here's a really weird idea. Magma contains dissolved gases. And as the magma approaches the surface, those gases bubble out of the magma. So if the magma is very fluid, if the lava is fluid like here in Hawaii, you get lava fountains. As the gas bubbles up through, it makes these amazing lava fountains. But because the lava is so fluid, the gas just bubbles away harmlessly. The same gas, if it was in a Cascadian volcano, the pressure would build and build and build and build until it just explodes without warning. We'll have some more fluid. Yeah. Hawaiian volcanoes are amazing. Uh, there's a lot of, I put some Hawaiian volcano videos in the playlist for the uh, tectonic section. So those are fluid. Let's look at explosive eruptions. You get really steep. In fact, Mount Fuji, Mount St. Helens, Mount Baker, Mount Cook, Mount Rainier, all the classic volcano mountains. You look at it and go, oh yeah, that's a volcano. It's probably a composite or stratovolcano. Less lava, but pyroclastics, that's a vocabulary term. Pyro means fire, clastic, broken up. So it's ash, dust, cinders, scoria, pumice, aerial bombs, the material that is ejected violently during one of these explosive eruptions. Pyroclastic flow. I'm not going to play this video. I really recommend watching it. This is Maurice and Katja Kraft. They were uh, French volcanologists. It was their dream to canoe down an active lava flow in a canoe. They were killed by one of these pyroclastic flows. Uh, yeah, pyro refers to fire, clastic broken up. So it's material that's broken up. Yeah, here they are hanging out right by an erupting volcano. And ironically, they were killed in the Philippines, Mount Unzen. Yeah, they were nuts. Here he is. If I die tomorrow, that would be sad, but it's okay because I'm happy. So, a pyroclastic flow, uh, also called a stone wind. The, one of my favorite terms is a nuée ardent, which is French for glowing cloud. So if this was nighttime in that cloud, it could be 300, 400, 500 degrees traveling 200 miles an hour. So it just looks like a cloud of dust, but that's superheated gas and ash. And at night it would glow. So nuée ardent means glowing cloud. And it refers to the idea that if you saw it at night, the gas and the rock would be so hot that it would actually be glowing. Uh, Maurice and Kachi were killed in this pyroclastic flow. And in the video, they point out, ironically, they were in a place, 41 people were killed at the same time. Uh, and they were all in an area that they all thought they were all volcano experts, and they were in a region that they thought would be safe. So it's, it's ironic that they were killed while they were trying to be safe. This is Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens, I think, is the best example of the difference between the Hawaiian and the, uh, the Hawaiian effusive eruptions and the explosive eruptions associated with continental crust. So that's Mount St. Helens today. All of that is gone. But in 1980... 1980, scientists were studying the mountain. That's after the eruption. This guy went out to take some pictures of it just before it erupted. Volcanic eruptions are easier to predict because you have to move magma to the surface. When you move magma to the surface, the mountain swells up. They were studying the deformation. They knew something was happening. So they had people in place watching it. 
And the first thing that happens is there's going to be a big landslide. The whole side of the mountain is just going to slip away. And when that slips away enough, the pressure inside that has been building is going to blast out sideways in a massive pyroclastic flow. So there's the whole, the whole mountain collapsing. And then you'll see as it As it collapses, oh, this guy's still talking, it erupts out sideways and obliterates everything. Boosh. Pyroclastic flow, the most dangerous part of a volcanic eruption. Oh, and this is volcanic glass. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's incredibly sharp. This is what damages lungs. Volcanic glass is not ash from fires. Ash from fires is relatively soft. This is, these are micro particles of glass and you can see they're very, very sharp. This is why it causes lung damage. So just like with real estate, I mentioned the shape cross section. This is a stratovolcano. It's got that steeper side formed of multiple layers of lava and ash, as opposed to a shield volcano formed with an effusive eruption, very flat, very boring. In fact, this is a cinder cone. This is the slope of the shield volcano. Very common to get cinder cones on. So there could be a cinder cone there, a little cinder cone there. Cinder cones are relatively small volcanoes. These stratovolcanoes are huge. Shield volcanoes are even larger. Um, these are two different forms of basaltic lava. This would be Aa. Uh -uh. This is Pahoyhoy. If it's flowing and it comes to rest and then it cools, it often has this smooth, ropey appearance. If, as the lava is cooling, it's still moving so it gets broken up, you get this sharp, angular, broken up material called ah uh -uh. More pahoyhoy, rhyolitic lava, uh, making a bread crust texture, bread crust texture as it contracts, as it cools. The Rift Valley in Iceland, where it's getting pulled apart, there's a river flowing down. So there's rifting, it's getting stretched apart to the, to the right on that side, to the left on this side. These are the Columbia River basalts. I said before when we were looking at the figure showing the locations of volcanic activity. Oh yeah, I'll say there was rifting like the Columbia River basalts. This is all basaltic magma, effusive, flowing over the landscape like motor oil. This is Mount Hood. Mount Hood is a stratovolcano caused by convergence. It is an explosive eruption. It will done blow up when it erupts. This is basalt, very fluid, effusive, caused by rifting. So two volcanoes in the same place or relatively close together formed out of totally different magma under totally different tectonic circumstances, creating totally different volcanic landforms. So the flood basalts, they're just flat and the composite volcano, very steep. Composite volcano made of lava, tephra is that broken up material. They are the largest, they are tall, they are steep. Uh, Pompeii, Mount Fuji, Mount St. Helens, Mount Shasta. They make explosive eruptions. Here we have Mount Fuji made of multiple, multiple eruptions of lava and ash and lava and ash. Hazards of the composite, the pyroclastic flow. We've already talked about that in the context of Mount St. Helens. High density mixture of hot, dry rock, hot gases. If it's nighttime, it'll be glowing. Can travel 100 miles an hour. I believe this is a, is a screen grab from Mount Unz, and I found that someplace else. Pyroclastic flow. A lahar is a volcanic mud flow. So there's a couple different ways you can get a lahar. You could have... An eruption in the tropics with lots of ash followed by a heavy rain event. That would give you a mud flow. You could also have it in the Cascades. Mount Lassen, when it erupted in 1917, the eruption melted the snow and the ice on the mountain. So the lava mixed together with the snow and ice to become a volcanic mud flow, a lahar. It's an Indonesian word for volcanic mud flow. A lahar. We saw one of these on day one, looking at geovisualization. Here we have how long you can live from, well, after, uh, I think this was Mount Rainier. After Mount Rainier erupts, you'll have 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes before the mud flow or lahar hits. Shield volcanoes are very wide, very boring. They're flat, 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 made of basaltic lava. 
usually don't explode. Shield volcanoes are incredibly flat. They are by volume some of the largest, but they're very flat. Shield volcanoes, flat. Cinder cones are small. Sunset crater, there's a bunch in Lassen. They're made of basaltic lava. They don't explode. Frothy basalt is ejected, lands close to the vent. This would be a cinder cone. It could be on the, sh on the side of a shield volcano. A plug dome, small to medium-sized. Lassen Peak is one of the world's largest, if not the largest, plug dome volcano. They are made of very, very stiff Felsic, uh, felsic iron and silica, lots of silicon, lots of, the higher the silicon, the more explosive they are. So in this case, the lava oozed out like toothpaste, incredibly thick. So whatever gases were trapped, they're not going anyplace because they're trapped by the lava being so thick. So it, it, yeah, let's just look at it. This is Mount Lassen. You can see that there's a core of solid rock and then the sides are just broken up material. So they're often made up of, of a core of material with broken up broken up uh, pyroclastic material on the sides. This is Mount, Mount Lassen when it erupted in 1915. This was, I think, taken in Redding or Red Bluff. You can see, although you can see the mushroom cloud from the eruption from, San, from Sacramento back in 1915 when Mount Lassen erupted. Caldera, it's just a crater at the top of many volcanoes. Uh, it can either be formed if the magma chamber drains out before it erupts, you can end up with a caldera. Or if the top is blown off, then you can end up with a caldera. Crater Lake is a caldera. <laughs> La Caldera is a caldera in La Paz. So here we've got a side view of Mauna Loa, which is a shield volcano, very, very large, very, very flat, as opposed to Mount Rainier, which is steeper, more dramatic, but you can see the volume of Mount Rainier way, way less than Mauna Loa. And here again is a side view of a shield volcano, and you can just see how incredibly flat they are. As opposed to a composite, uh, I think this is Mount Shishkin in the Chamkat Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia made of multiple flows of ash and lava. This is the cinder cone in Lassen, and this is the shield volcano. This is called Prospect Peak right here. So you can see the slope of the shield volcano. And then on the side, there's this little cinder cone. There's the cinder cone. There's the slope of the shield volcano. This is Mount Lassen taken from the summit of the shield. I'm sorry, from the cinder cone. This is the cinder cone. This is Mount Lassen, Lassen's a plug dome, and this is Prospect Peak, which is a big shield volcano. And Lassen is unique in that shield volcanoes are associated with uh, effusive eruptions and divergent boundaries. The crust is actually getting pulled apart in this region, but over here there's, in fact, uh, towards the coast there's subduction with the Juan de Fuca plate getting stuffed under the North American plate, bubbling to the top and making volcanoes. So here's uh, Mount Lassen, the world's largest plug dome volcano, very, very steep sides. Here is a shield volcano, much more gradual, gentle slope. Mount Lassen, some sort of shield volcano. This is why people go play with shield volcanoes. That basaltic lava, it doesn't explode. You can go play with it. This is Cody Gibson, a former student out on the big island of Hawaii playing with an active lava flow. Composite volcano. Volcanic hazards uh, are not as bad as, as earthquake hazards, although if a volcano erupts, the effects could be much worse because we have warning. In fact, if I just get to the picture, yeah. So in order for the volcano to erupt, you need to move, you need to move magma to the surface. And when that happens, the shape of the mountain is going to swell up. So by studying the deformation of the ground, we know what's going on. Also, as that magma moves towards the surface, you get earthquakes called harmonic tremors that they can pick up with seismometers. As the magma approaches the surface, gas bubbles out, and we can measure that. So there's many different ways of monitoring volcanoes to make sure that they don't surprise us with an eruption. So volcanoes are one type of mountain, but let's look at episodes of mountain building. Episodes of mountain building are called orogenesis, oro, mountain, genesis, birth. 
and we're pretty much going to focus on convergent tectonic boundaries. So there's three types of convergent boundaries because there's two types of crust. You've got oceanic crust and continental crust. The three combinations of those two things are oceanic, continental, oceanic, oceanic, and then continental, continental. Each of these three types of boundary is going to produce uh, a, a distinct landscape with a cool name. So the first one, uh, this is an oceanic continental boundary. This is called an Andean boundary named after the Andes Mountains. So you've got oceanic crust getting stuffed under continental crust, making a chain of volcanoes. This is an Andean boundary, oceanic crust subducting with continental. The oceanic crust is going to get stuffed under. A Japanese boundary, you typically end up with an island arc or a chain of volcanoes. One or both of the oceanic crust is going to subduct. In this case, just the oceanic crust. This again is a Japanese boundary. This is the way the Japanese islands are being formed. Many of the islands that when we're looking at the seismic explorer, the Aleutians, those are all uh, formed by this type of convergence. So oceanic, oceanic, a Japanese boundary, and you typically get a big chain of volcanoes. And then finally, continental, continental crust creates a Himalayan boundary. So there's no subduction because both of the crusts are continental. So nobody goes down, the crust gets shorter and thicker, making, for example, the Himalayas. You can also make mountains, you can also make mountains by faulting. So either by pushing plates together or by pulling plates apart. So by pulling plates apart with tension, you get normal faults, and those create uh, down-dropped fault blocks. That landscape uh, is made up of horsts and grobbins. I'll just look at the, at the diagram. So here we have a whole series of normal faults. This area is getting pulled apart. The down-dropped fault block is a, is a grobbin. Uh, I would remember that a technique or a tip, maybe graben like grave is the down dropped part. The high part is the horst, horst, graben. Horst, graben. Horst is the high part. Graben is the trench. Horst is the high part. This is Death Valley. Death Valley is a big down dropped graben. We're on a horst. On the other side is another horst. Another diagram showing the same thing with a graben, horst, graben, horst, graben. The Red Sea is a down-dropped fault block. So this, all of these Horst and Graben found across the American Southwest, across California and Nevada. Those are examples of normal faults caused by tension. Here is a diagram showing how this occurs and an amazing photograph in Iran of a landscape that looks exactly like the diagram. You almost never see that. So down drop fault block caused by tension, the crust being pulled apart, and then this is dropping down. Hanging wall, foot wall. The hanging walls drop down relative to the foot wall. Oh, uh, this is my old Subaru. This is taken at the base of Mount Whitney on the east side of the Sierras. So in 1872, the ground here was up here. There was a magnitude 6 earthquake that resulted, uh, and the ground dropped down as the crust was pulled apart. So this would be a fault scarp, the 1872 Lone Pine Fault Scarp. Uh, this, is, this is Saline Valley. Over here is Telescope Peak. On the other side is Death Valley. So now we're in Death Valley looking back at Telescope Peak. Down dropped fault block, Graben. And I turned around to take a picture of these wildflowers and didn't realize until I looked at it on a computer that I got this fault scarp. So you can see the foreground has dropped down relative to the background, making this cliff. That's a fault scarp. This would be a normal fault caused by tension. That's it for this incredibly long chapter. This will be the last chapter that's going to be on the third midterm. That's it for today's lesson. If you have any questions, please let me know. See you next chapter.